Okay, so we're going to investigate the phylum Annelida by looking at the earthworms. Just a common earthworm you can buy at the bait store. Look at all these awesome, juicy worms looking really good today. So the phylum Annelida then. Commonly, these organisms are known as segmented roundworms, and they are triploblastic. Just remember what triploblastic means, three body layers. They are coelomates, which means they've got a true coelomic cavity, and they have bilateral symmetry. All right, so they are the three body plan characteristics that help define this phylum. But the annelids also, most of them have these little bristles along their body called CT. And on some of the annelids, they're really obvious. On this one, they're not so obvious, but we can kind of feel them. All right, so the phylum Annelida is divided into two classes. One is the polychaetes, or class polychaeta, and the other one are the oligochaetes, or class oligochaeta. And the earthworm, that's this guy, Lumbricus terrestris, is in the class oligochaeta. And that means it just has a few bristles per body segment. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the external characteristics of the earthworm. And I've got to keep this guy moist. That's why I'm continually dousing it with water because they breathe through their skin. So that's where they undergo gas exchange through their skin. And the skin needs to be kept moist because gases dissolve or diffuse from the atmosphere into the moisture that covers their skin. And then they can move into the blood and the capillaries which are in their epidermal layer and just below the epidermis. So we've got to keep it skit, uh, moist, otherwise the animal can suffocate. Now you might be able to see a red line running along the animal on its dorsal surface and that would be its dorsal blood vessel. Now we'll see that when we do the dissection but that dark line which is a bit more obvious here that's the dorsal blood vessel. Blood moves through it but just through the body wall, you can see the dorsal blood vessel, and you can actually see blood moving through it in little pulses very, very slowly. Now it's moving slowly because the animal is cold. Now you can also see those yellow cells through the body wall. Do you remember what those are from the dissection? Right, they're called chlorogenous cells. But that's pretty cool. What I might need to do is speed up this video clip so you can actually see the blood move because it goes through in very slow pulses. Now the blood moves because of the action of the five pairs of pseudo hearts, but also it's capable of sort of a peristaltic contraction. Okay, so some external characteristics of the animal then. First, I want you to get oriented to its dorsal versus ventral surface. So it likes to be ventral surface down and dorsal surface up and the dorsal surface is a lot darker than the ventral surface and I'll flip the animal over and you'll be able to see that. There you go, the lighter ventral surface and there's the darker dorsal surface and again it likes to be ventral or sort of belly side down. If I turn it over and I can't refer to it as a he or she or a boy or girl because they're hermaphrodite. So and you'll see it will write itself. It will sort of go ventral surface down and then dorsal surface up. This guy is not terribly active. I think it's just very cold. Um, there you go, but it's writing itself. Okay, the next thing I want you to notice is the segmentation on the worm. So you'll notice its body is divided into these segments. All right, and each of those segments are kind of fused together and each segment internally is very, very similar to its neighboring segment. In fact, the segments along this end of the animal are virtually identical to each other internally, but the segments in this anterior part of the animal, there's specialization inside that we'll see after we've done the dissection. So their body is composed of these sort of fused segments and internally they're separated from each other by a very thin membrane called a septum. And we've got to break through that when we do the dissection. So the segments are basically very similar to each other except in this anterior part where there's internal specialization, especially in the reproductive and digestive structures. Okay, so you'll notice how the animal moves. And just by observing how the animal moves, you get a really good idea of what its musculature is like. Now you can clearly see here that the animal gets long and thin 
and then it kind of gets short and fat and then pulls the body along. So if I move it down this way, it doesn't like it right now because it's very bright lights. It's a little warmer than the animal wants. So it's, it's saying, oh, I've got to get out of here. And it's sort of feeling its surroundings to think where it needs to go. But so let's again have a look at how it moves. So, oh, now it's stopped moving. Come on. Really stopped moving. Sometimes you want it to stop moving. At this point, I don't. Ah, there you go. Okay, good. So you notice then how it gets long and thin. And then kind of short and fat. Now let's think about the muscles that it uses to do that. So in order to get very long and thin, it has to kind of go from fat to thin like that. And there are circular muscles, muscles that encircle its body. And when it contracts those, it will get thin and that will make it go long. Now, in order for it to get shorter and fatter, those circular muscles have to relax, but then it's got these longitudinal muscles, these muscles that run the whole length of the body that it contracts to get shorter. So long and thin means that it will contract the circular muscles and relax the longitudinal muscles. Short and fat means it's going to relax the circular muscles and contract the longitudinal muscles. Now just here you can see it kind of bent round to the left, it moved round to the left. And it does that by contracting the longitudinal muscles on its left hand side while relaxing the longitudinal muscles on the right hand side. And it's doing it quite nicely now. So it can coordinate all of those muscle movements to go where it kind of wants to go. Now that takes a lot of processing power and earthworms for being very simple animals actually have fairly complicated nervous systems. And again, we'll see some of that when we open up the animal. So it's sensing its surroundings, it's deciding it doesn't like it, it wants to get out of there. And so it's using its nervous system and its muscle system to sort of, to say, all right, I gotta get out of here. And, and it's making those movements to try and do that. Okay. So this is obviously its anterior end, and this is obviously its posterior end. We've already looked at its dorsal and ventral surface. Now you'll see this one, it's not quite as clear, but if I roll it over, you'll see this, this kind of lighter region just there. And I think that's about where the clitellum would be. And worms, when they're in sort of reproductive mode, about this region of the animal, I don't know, it's about maybe 30 segments down, it changes a little bit. And um, right now you can't see it on this one, but we call it a clitellum or the saddle. Maybe I'll pull out some other worms and see if we can find that. But so anterior of the saddle is where we see most of the specializations. And when we do our dissection, we'll open it up um, around this area and then open up this part of the animal. So our anterior part, and then we've got the clitellum. Now if I hold the animal, and again, if you were doing this in class, I would have you pick up the animals and feel it. You can't, obviously you can't feel it because you're watching the video, but I can feel it right now. I can feel these little tiny bristles poking out on my finger. If I sort of run my finger along there, it just feels a little bit rough. And there are these tiny little bristles, about two pairs per segment that the animal can poke out and pull back in. And it uses that, those CT they're called, those bristles, to anchor themselves in their burrow, but also enable them to move. So they're continually being pushed out and pulled in, and I can feel them if I run my fingers along the animal like that. In fact, you can see I'm sort of pulling it a little bit. Oh, you can really see it nicely there. They're, they're, I can feel it on my fingers. All right. Okay. So that's most of the external characteristics of the animal I want you to see, and I wanted you to observe how it moves, and I want you to think about the musculature internally that causes it to move, and then the nervous system processing power that's required to contract those muscles. Now again, if you were doing this, you would be able to see this dorsal blood vessel, and you can actually see blood being pumped along it. So maybe later we'll try and zoom in and look at the um, blood moving in that vessel. Now what's kind of interesting is if I was to um, fill this up with water and add a little bit of caffeine, which is a stimulant, you would actually see the pulses of blood along the dorsal vessel get faster because it's a stimulant. 
And if I was to add a little bit of vodka, a little bit of alcohol, that would absorb into the worm very quickly. And you would notice the blood move much more slowly. Those pulses would be more slowly. So stimulants and depressants can affect um, the movement of blood flow, blood movement through that dorsal vessel. Now there's also a ventral vessel that you usually, oh, you can actually see it quite nicely there. I was gonna say you usually can't see it, but you can actually see it quite nicely, that little line, there's a ventral vessel. And so the dorsal vessel carries blood along one way and the ventral vessel carries it along the other. Now if you can see blood moving along a vessel, what does that mean? What does that mean the animal must have? Well, it must have some way of moving the blood and many animals have hearts, all right, which is a muscular pump in order to move the, the blood along. And earthworms do. They've got five pairs of pseudo hearts, and again, we'll see those um, when we open up the animal. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to have to kill this guy. Um, but if you've ever seen the Princess Bride movie, where um, Wesley is mostly dead, that's what I want to do to this guy. I want to sort of mostly kill it. So I want to sort of stun it and, and for the animal to be dead. But I don't want to cook it, because when you cook, an animal, when you raise its temperature too high, then all the proteins change. Um, they change color, they're not the same consistency as what they were. Um, blood is no longer a nice bright red because you've cooked it. So I wanna dunk it in some hot water real quick, enough to, to basically kill the animal, but I would really like to preserve the colors and consistency of the tissues inside. And sometimes we can open them up and see the pseudo hearts still beating and we're going to look at these structures called seminal vesicles and spermatheci, where the worm sperm is. And you can sometimes see those still swimming through the microscope. And as a bonus, when we open up the seminal vesicles, which is where the wor um, worm sperm matures, there's actually a little parasite, a little protozoan parasite that pretty much all worms have. It doesn't matter what continent I've done this dissection in, whether it's Europe or North America or Africa. And they all seem to have this little parasite in their seminal vesicles. It's a little lemon-shaped parasite, and it munches on worm sperm. And we'll have a look at those through the microscope as well. All right, so say goodbye to our little worm. We're going to dunk it in some hot water and um, open them up. All right, so we're going to take our worm, and we're going to try and mostly kill it. All right, so over here we've got a beaker of water. There's a little magna stirrer going on inside. I'm going to turn that off move the magna stirrer. So this water's pretty hot. Like, I don't know what temperature it is, but if I dunk my finger in, it feels real hot. Now I want to put it in, oh, I don't know, I'm guessing about four or five seconds. It's really not an exact science, but again, you want it just enough to kill it, but not enough to cook it. Now I just forewarn you, sometimes you don't put it in long enough and um, it sort of starts to come back to life a little bit. And obviously I don't want that to happen, but um, and, it, and I wouldn't say it's coming back to life, but it's still got some nerves and muscles that, that are functioning. All right, so we're gonna go in, count to three, and quickly remove it. One, two, three, one more, all right. So hopefully that's good. It feels really hot. I'm just gonna make sure it's, all right. Okay, so hopefully then, some of the internal structures are still sort of working off of reflex, um, but the animal's dead. I guess we don't have to worry about it breathing anymore, do we? Okay. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna kind of open up the body wall just um, posterior of the clitellum, which you can just about see there. So there are about, I know, 30 or 40 segments along there. And you can sometimes count back the number of segments to find the structure if you can't see what the clitellum looks like. <clears throat> so. The body wall is held in place by these septa. And so as I pull open the body wall with the forceps, you'll kind of see them as these little membranes. That's it. And I'm going to use pins to hold open the body wall. Now, notice the angle at which I'm putting the pins in. Okay. I'm, putting, I'm not putting them in like that, I'm putting them in at an angle, so just to give tension on the body wall, which is remarkably strong. <clears throat> so as I open up the body wall, again, you'll see that it's held in place by these septa. And so I'm gonna need to break the septa 
with this needle. You can just tease along like that. Got to be real careful because I don't want to break into the, the gut. You'll see as I tease through, the body wall sort of opens up a bit more nicely. Again, I'm trying to keep my hands out of the light that we're using to record this. So that's why it might look a bit awkward and I apologize for the shadows. All right, you can already see some of those internal organs that we're gonna look at in a bit more detail. But first, let's just get it opened up. There we go. All right, now it starts to get interesting. You see those little white structures? Hopefully there's something alive or moving inside. That would be pretty awesome. Okay, <clears throat> a little bit more at the front. Now this front one is, is the toughest part to open up because there are all these little connections from the worm's pharynx to the body wall. And they're quite tough. And so remember these guys they burrow through the soil, and as they do, they consume the soil. It goes into their mouth. Their mouth is right just there, and then it moves along their gut. And there's quite, the gut is quite musculature, it's quite muscly, to um, help the food move along, or help the soil move along. And then it digests organic material in the soil. All right. So I might need to do one more little snip just to open it up. It's very difficult to see. Now there's a nerve ganglion right in that region there, which we'll see if we can show you later, which I didn't want to snip through, but um, I did want to try to open it up so you can see that. All right. So it's looking pretty good so far. Just a little bit more. All right, it's a tough one. I just want to open up a little bit more. I don't think I opened it up enough. Okay, I'm gonna go take a coffee break. No, I'm kidding, I need to get more pins. Okay, I just wanna open up a little bit more posteriorly so you can see that we have lots of specialization in the segments there, but from the clitellum down to the end of the worm, the anterior end, uh, sorry, posterior end, there's much less specialization in the segments. In fact, the segments are all very similar to each other. You can see that here. Ooh, what you can also see very nicely with those septa. Now, where I clumsily opened it up, that brown or black part there, that's the dirt. So I busted through the, um, the gut when the animal was pinned and I was opening it up, and opening it up a bit more. But Okay, so we can see most of the structures I want you to see right here. Now they're real tiny, but we'll go 
from the anterior end and sort of work our way posteriorly. All right, so we decided to get out our big guns. This is our half million dollar camera and we're really tightly zoomed in, which is awesome. So first I'm gonna go along the digestive system. So just underneath here, you can't really see it, is the mouth. All right, and of course it takes the soil in through its mouth. Then it passes into the buccal cavity, which is this first little part of the digestive tube just there. And then it goes into the pharynx, which is this sort of quite muscular part of the digestive system. And there are all these little hair-like structures which attach the pharynx to the body wall. And then by peristalsis, muscles of the digestive system move the food into the esophagus and it moves along, keeps moving along by peristalsis and then it will hit this first little sac here, which is the crop. And that's kind of analogous to your stomach, although they don't really have a stomach. That's the closest analogy. But the crop is just this um, little sac of the digestive system where the food is stored and then it's moved into this very muscular part, which is the gizzard. And these muscles of the gizzard are gonna be contracting and you've got grit in the soil and organic content in the soil and the grit kind of pulverizes the organic content. And then the food moves past and it moves into this last part of the digestive system. Now I've butchered it a little bit because I've had to move it aside, but by peristalsis, the soils move down, enzymes are mixed with the soil, the enzymes break down the organic content, um, they break down big organic molecules into teeny tiny little ones so they can be absorbed across the gut wall into the blood capillaries, which are in the lining of the gut wall, and then ultimately the capillaries make their way into the dorsal and the ventral blood vessels. Now you can see the dorsal, oh, sorry, I forgot to point out the orange colored chlorogenous cells that we talked about earlier, they have kind of an analogous function to your liver. All right, so now let's talk about the um, circulatory system. So that little red line there, and it kind of disappears a little bit, carries on going up there. That red line is the dorsal blood vessel, and that connects into five pairs of pseudo hearts. Now you can see one sac of one of the pairs of one of the pseudo hearts just there, and you can see them sort of in this region here. They're sometimes a little bit hard to see, although if I move that apart, you can see another one. Anyway, there are five pairs of these pseudo hearts and they are muscular thickenings of vessels and they contract and they help pump the blood. And they move the blood from the dorsal vessel into the ventral vessel. Now the ventral vessel is underneath this part of the gut, it's underneath there, but you can just see the ventral vessel is that red line just there. So as you can see then, the blood moves around the worm, it's got a closed circulatory system, it moves around by the action of the contraction of those five pairs of pseudo hearts. Okay, over here you can really nicely see the double ventral nerve cord, those whitish lines there, there's actually a pair of nerve cords very close to each other, and then you can see nerves branching off of that ventral nerve cord. Now, the nerve cord continues to go underneath the gut, underneath, 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 and then it gets to this region here, and I don't think you can see them even with our super fancy camera gear, but they sort of come up and they encircle, they go around the buccal cavity, and there are little thickenings just there called ganglia, and they're the cerebral ganglia. We'll see if we can have a look at those under the microscope maybe. All right, so now some of the reproductive structures. We've got these sort of brown tan color structures and there are three pairs of them. One pair, two pair, and then a third pair. I think that's the third pair. There's one there. I can't really see the other one on this side. But those three pairs of structures are called seminal vesicles. And that's where the sperm, after they've been made, they go into the seminal vesicles and they sit there for a while and they mature. And then from the seminal vesicles, the sperm are moved to these structures. And there are two pairs of these. So there will be one on this side and it's opposing um, one of the pair on that side. And there's the second pair there and the opposing one underneath um, these structures on this side. I don't think you can see the sperm on this side, but you can definitely see the two just there. And that's where the sperm are stored. Okay, so that when the animal reproduces, it releases the sperm and can fertilize eggs in another worm. Now, as I said, the worms um, are hermaphroditic. You can see the um, sperm producing apparatus here, um, but I, I can't show you, it's too small, not developed, but the parts of the worm that would produce the ovaries. 
So this is what it looks like if you pluck out a spermatheca from a worm and put it under the compound microscope at 400 times magnification. Now, these are all worm sperm and they're swimming like crazy, creating these currents. Now, I'll see if I can focus on another area which has them maybe moving a little bit more slowly, but you can very clearly see their tails and they really are just moving like crazy. All right, so anyway, that's a really nice look at some of these internal structures of the worm. I'll just point out these lines of the scepter, which you can really clearly see. And there would be a sheet of membrane that sort of connects them internally and separates them, which I had to break through in order um, to open up the body wall. All right, pretty awesome.